Heroes of the Merchant Marine. Heroes of the Merchant Marine. The thrilling true stories of men who are heroes aboard ship. A program salute to the men who serve and live for their country by sailing the world's seaways to deliver to our troops and allies the vital supplies of a victorious new world. Heroes of the Merchant Marine is a series of programs dedicated to America's brave merchant seamen, the everyday common men who are heroes every day they sail the pathways of the world. These are true stories narrated by Ray Lewis and transcribed from the confidential files of the War Shipping Administration. the inspiring story of Captain Gus Warren Darnell, here is Ray Lewis. This is about a man whose life was the sea. He spent his life on the sea, and he had earned the rank of Master Mariner on the sea. Captain Gus Darnell did not only love the sea and know all there was to know about ships, but he also knew men, for he was a leader of men, as this true story proves. He was a quiet man by nature, but he loved a good joke. And back home in Houston, Texas, he enjoyed treating his wife and neighbors to the fine repertoire of sea stories he collected during his many voyages around the world. His blue eyes twinkled and his ruddy face wrinkled in a happy grin when he'd tell his stories to the neighbors. But on the bridge of his ship, his eyes took in everything with just a businesslike, matter-of-fact glance. And his men, seeing him up there on the bridge, went about their business confidently... Because Captain Darnell knew what it was all about. He knew the sea and ships and men. He was a good captain to sail with. It was during the very early days of the war, and Captain Darnell was on his way to the South Pacific with precious supplies that were vitally needed by our troops. His ship was the SS Cardonia, and it had been his ship for a number of years. He knew its every part, its every piece of machinery, its every gauge. For it was his ship, from stem to stern, from funnel to engine room. It was dawn, and the Cardonia was only a few days from its destination. Captain Darnell had just come onto the bridge when suddenly the lookout called, Submarine, up the starboard beam! Captain Darnell sounded general quarters and looked toward the starboard. Yes, there it was. The telltale feathery wake that announced a black slammy visitor, a coy visitor that cared to show only her periscope and nothing else. But that was enough. Captain, she's fired a torpedo. It's our left rudder helmsman. Aye, sir. The ship slowly swings to the left as the torpedo churns a straight line toward her. Miss, sir. They missed. Inches. Just by inches, sir. Good work, Larson. Straighten her out. This is tricky business. Very tricky business. An unarmed merchant ship trying to outmaneuver torpedoes. One man in a big cargo-heavy ship against a sub full of torpedoes. And this one man has to outguess the sub. The odds are long. Too long. Helmsman. Right, Rudder. Aye, sir. Torpedo, sir. Off port bow. 
Another one, Miss Sir. We're we're lucky. Too lucky, helmsman. Swing her around, uh, full right rudder. We'll have to run for it. Full speed, Larson. The Cardonia swings around, and the loaded merchant ship tries to run from the sub. Submarine service off third. That means they'll shell us as we run, helmsman. Full speed, Larson. Everything you got. Pour it on. The sub's right behind us. We'll be shelled any minute. I'm giving her all she'll hold, sir. Are you hurt, helmsman? No. No, sir. <laughs> we only have half a roof, sir. No use changing course. They're right behind us. Just keep straight ahead. Maybe they'll run out of shells. <laughs> race was on, one of the most one-sided races in the history of the sea. The surface Jap sub only a few hundred yards behind the unarmed, desperately plodding cargo ship, unable to stop the rain of shells from the sub's deck cannon. More than an hour of constant shelling, fatal, maddening shelling. More than an hour, almost an eternity for Captain Darnell as he watched his ship being gradually blown from under him. A fire, the first of many, was started on the lower deck and it was blazing furiously. The entire superstructure was a mass of debris and flames. Another fire raged along the sides, burning almost every one of the ship's lifeboats. Fire below decks, turning the engine room into an inferno. And finally... Sir, the steering gear won't work. Won't work, sir. Captain Darnell looked about him, and his ship was a terrible, burning, broken mockery of what had once been the SS Cardonia. His ship was a flaming mass of debris... There was nothing else to do but... Abandon the ship. <clears throat> abandon ship. All hands, abandon ship. What was left of the crew gathered at the side, near the only lifeboat left by the Jap sub. Three life rafts were filled with men and lowered safely over the side. The remaining 23 seamen crowded into the one lifeboat, Captain Darnell aboard. And they began their descent from what had been the Cardonia to the sea. But the Japs had one last finishing touch to add to the little drama. Just one last finishing touch. A fine sense of humor. Their last departing shell hit the fuel tank. And the men in that crowded, lowering lifeboat were showered with burning oil. Captain Darnell jumped to the lifeboat's ropes. Cut the lines! Dilly, cut our lines right now! The captain and another man immediately cut the lifeboat's lines, and the ship dropped with a heavy crash onto the rough sea. The sudden drop had snuffed out the flames of the oil that showered the men. The exploding fuel tank had killed one man. The rest were safe. By letting the lifeboat drop to the sea from the deck of the burning Cardonia... Captain Darnell had saved 25 lives. The men looked about them. The Cardonia wouldn't last five more minutes. The wind was pushing them away from the boat. The sub had disappeared. It had done its work. There were only the three life rafts drifting away from the crowded lifeboat. The sharp wind, the rough shifting sea, and the Cardonia sinking fast. Soon the burned, shattered hull disappeared beyond the horizon as the lifeboat drifted with the wind. But Captain Darnell gazed in the direction of his dead unseen ship for long minutes afterward. The 23 men in his boat also looked toward the spot where they knew that their ship was being buried by an angry sea. But even if his ship were dead, he was still captain. And Master Mariner Gus Darnell proved his seamanship once more. He set sail for the nearest land and broke the long silence with... Men, Men, uh, if my calculations are right, there's a small piece of land about 30 miles from here, and we're going to make that island before the sun goes down. If the Lord is with us... Just as Captain Darnell promised, land was sighted that afternoon. Good, solid, unsinkable land. Wearily, the 23 men got out of the battered lifeboat and waded ashore most of them dropping exhausted on the first piece of dry land their feet had touched since leaving the States. Then some of them noticed that the captain hadn't left the lifeboat. He whispered something in the first mate's ear. The mate nodded, and then they prepared to shove off again. Captain Darnell turned to his men there on the island beach. 
Men, somebody has to find the boys who've drifted away on those life rafts. Somebody has to guide them to this island. The mates agreed to go with me, so we'll be back in a few hours. With that, Captain Darnell shoved off again into the rough sea, with darkness closing in on them, with only hope and luck to aid them, searching for those three lost rafts that had been drifting for hours. But no matter. They were his crew, and he owed them his duty. And he would have continued his search till he found them, had not a Navy cutter come along with the good news that the men had already been found. Only then did Captain Gus Darnell stop his search and begin thinking about his next ship. Yes, he was a good captain to sail with. When the President of the United States awarded him the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Medal, this citation read... To Gus Warren Darnell, Master Mariner, for distinguished service in enemy action. Attacked by an enemy submarine, he so skillfully maneuvered his ship as to cause two torpedoes to miss. As his ship was unarmed, he attempted to run from the submarine, which was also attacking by gunfire at close range. For over an hour, he strove to outdistance the foe. Only when enemy shells had started two serious fires wrecked the superstructure, demolished all but one of the lifeboats, and so disabled the steering gear that the ship was out of control, did he reluctantly give orders to abandon ship. The only usable lifeboat had been punctured by shell fragments, and while engaged in lowering away, a shell hit the fuel tank and showered the crew with burning oil. Yet he so expertly supervised this operation that all but one of his crew got safely away, with 22 men crowded into the boat and the remainder distributed on three life rafts. He set sail for the nearest land, 30 miles away, disembarked most of the men, and endeavored to set out again into a heavy sea for the men left on the life raft. Only when assured that these men had been rescued by a naval vessel did he cease his determined efforts to go to their assistance. His expert ship handling, his courageous leadership and his fine concern for the safety of his crew were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Merchant Marine. For the President, signed Emery Scotland, Chairman. which you have just heard, was one in a series of Heroes of the Merchant Marine. Program salutes to our brave merchant seamen as transcribed from the confidential files of the War Shipping Administration. (laughs) 